Hi, this is Kimberly. This is a synopsis and a critique of chapter 26 of the book Letters from Christopher, Tragic Confessions of the Watts Family Murders. This book is by Cheryl and Cadle, and the chapter is titled Prison Life. So I spent way too much time on the first two sentences of this chapter. I found them to be confusing. We aren't supposed to be bewildered like this when reading true crime. We are reading it to get information and clarification, correct? Maybe it's just me, so I'll let you decide. That's what Mrs. Scribble tells us to do in the book, after all. There have just been too many sentences that are not clear in this book. So here they are, the first two sentences that kind of threw me for a loop. Quote, The night after sentencing, plans were made to take Christopher to Weld County Jail. Christopher was in the Colorado prison for seven and a half weeks, during which time he was threatened, yelled at by other inmates, and told ways he could kill himself, end quote. So this sent me to the internet to try and figure out what she was saying. Let me break it down. First of all, quote, the night after the sentencing, plans were made to take Christopher to Weld County Jail, end quote. I'm not being a smartass when I say this baffled me. It wasn't until the next morning that I think I figured it out. I was truly confused and I thought, well, what did they do the night of sentencing? Because she said the night after. So after I had a night's sleep, I realized that what she probably meant was that night after sentencing. So I got that part figured out. Was it simply a typo or a misunderstanding on my part? All I know is it stopped me in my tracks, and I refused to go any further until I had the problem of sentence one and sentence two of chapter 26 solved. They were like thing one and thing two from Cat in the Hat. You know how they cause mischief. So next was, quote, plans were made to take Christopher to Weld County Jail, end quote. Wasn't that where he had been? And if so, didn't they just take him back there? Again, not being a smartass, I was befuddled, and I want to know what the hell I'm talking about so I can sound all insightful and intelligent and stuff. The second sentence has two parts that did not make sense to me. Quote, Christopher was in the Colorado prison for seven and a half weeks. The first part being the Colorado prison. The second part being seven and a half weeks. So I searched for, is Weld County Jail considered a prison? Then, what Colorado prison was Chris Watts in? During my research, I found an interesting article from a Colorado lawyer on the difference between Weld County Jail and a prison. But why the fuck am I researching this when I'm reading a book that is supposed to be telling me what happened? It really started to annoy the piss out of me. I'll link that article in the description. It really was educational. So the second part of this sentence was the seven and a half weeks she was talking about. So I did some calculations. Watts went to Weld County Jail upon his arrest August 15th and remained there until the sentencing. That's 96 days or 13 weeks and 5 days. So, two weeks and one day after sentencing, he was moved to Dodge Correctional Institution in Wisconsin. So what the hell is this seven and a half weeks she is talking about? Please, if I am misunderstanding Mrs. Scribble, or if I have my facts wrong, please inform me. And then I realized I was gritting my teeth while researching this. Now my jaws are achy. Thanks, Chris Sibble. That's another one of those clever names I've come up with. It's Chris and Scribble together. Crap, I'm off track again. Why do I keep going down this rabbit hole just to try and find out what Scribble is talking about? And then I still don't know. If this was just another typo and I researched it for nothing, 
Please don't tell me. I'll only lose my shit. I've spent too much time on this. And then I go from one thing to another. And then the whole damn day is wasted because of my undiagnosed ADD. We are only on the first two sentences and already I'm exasperated. You know, like when you've seen a movie where somebody gets pissed off and they try and tear up that very thing that's bringing them such anguish and they're unsuccessful so it enrages them even more and then they just clear their desk with one fell swoop and kick over trash cans and stuff well that's where I am right now with this book it's kinda funny and it's kinda not and no I didn't do any of that but in my mind I did so when I'm finished reading this book I think I'll try my best to rip it to shreds and of course my attempt will be fruitless, but at least I'll be too worn out afterwards to throw a full-on tantrum. Then I will slowly and carefully smooth out the wrinkled pages of that poor blameless book, simultaneously soothing my nerves, and then I'll make the Christmas tree craft I told y'all about last week, where you can use an old telephone book or letters from Christopher to make a Christmas tree. It'll be all therapeutic and shit. So where was I? Oh yes, I had gotten in a lather over the first two sentences. Let's move on. According to A&E Channel, quote, on December 3rd, 2018, Watts was transferred from a Colorado prison to Dodge Correctional Institution in Waupun, Wisconsin. He has been moved out of Colorado for security reasons due to him being a high-profile offender. Mark Fairburn, a Colorado Department of Correction spokesperson, stated at the time, end quote. So, golly gee willikers, Mr. Wilson, that would have been something Scribble could have questioned Nimrod about. What Colorado prison was Dickhead in? Or was he staged at Well County Jail until they found placement for him? Since she won't tell us, I did find out on my own that the Weld County Jail is usually temporary placement after an arrest. One, however, can be sentenced to the Weld County Jail on misdemeanor convictions or if the sentence for a crime is less than two years. Prison for Weld County Offenders is run by the Colorado Department of Corrections. The DOC oversees 24 prisons, also called correctional facilities, or centers across Colorado. You're welcome. So let's move past these first sentences that sent me into a tizzy. I'm really fed up. Okay, so the other inmates were picking on Shithead, intimidating and upsetting him. He was yelled at, badgered, threatened, and offered suggestions and recommendations on ways in which to kill himself. It really hurt his feelings. Eventually it stopped. Bitch ass says because they either grew tired of it or realized they weren't gonna get a reaction from him. So Chris apparently has gone back to being his meek little self where everyone picks on him. You know, like how he accuses Shanann of unkind treatment. The difference is these assholes don't love you like your wife did, you fool. But Scribble says, quote, had they been able to get to him, though, they would have most definitely killed him, end quote. I'm sure they would have, but I don't think this should be stated as fact. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't all hold out hope. Just saying. Since he was on suicide watch, the only thing he had was a paper gown. Serves his dumbass right for all those years Shanann sat in a cold room wearing a paper gown waiting for the obstetrician to come in. But wearing a paper gown, he had a small pad in which to lay on the floor without a pillow or a blanket. Aww. Well, you know, it's not one of those all-inclusive resorts Shanann took your dumb ass to, and the prison had no idea what the hell to expect from you. So laying on a cement floor sounds like it was the optimal situation for Asshat to think about what he had done. I don't think he spent long enough in that kind of environment, because he is back to being passive-aggressive, and he seems to be too damn happy. I bet San Diego is sounding pretty epic while he was wallowing on the floor. What a fucktard. If you'll remember, he didn't want to go on that last trip to San Diego because he was in the heavy flirting stage with NK at this point. Chris and Nikki met up 
together outside of work following this Thrive Lifestyle getaway in June 2018. After that trip, the two met at a park in Thornton and continued to see each other until the murders in August. I'll include the video of when Chris and Shanann arrived in San Diego. He was mentally preoccupied with her. Now knowing what I know, I can kind of tell in this video he was like, I don't want to be here. In Chris's Wisconsin interview, he said, quote, like, I was in San Diego talking to my friend Mark. I told him about Nikki, but I didn't tell him I was going to meet up with her. I just told him there was this girl at work that I've been talking to, but I'm distancing myself from her. I was just letting it exponentially get worse. If I had told him, hey, you know, he would have been like, whoa, man, take a step back and look. And like, don't fall into that trap. You're going to be alone for five weeks. End quote. So on the San Diego trip, Knucklehead was starting to mentally check out. Don't you hate that? When you're excited to do something special and have some fun, but the person you were with wants to act like a prick. Not to mention she was on a business trip and about to leave him to his own devices for about six weeks. So I've totally gotten away from talking about chapter 26. Let me reel it back in. Listen to this little tidbit Scribble wrote. Quote, he was in a state of extreme trauma from what had happened and nothing still made sense to him. Because of that and because he could still feel a dark spirit inside of him, he says he was not able to remember very much about what happened. Why is she saying this shit again? First that it happened to him. It's not a set of circumstances in which he found himself in. No, he caused it. He did this. It sounds as though she is insinuating he had no control over the situation. And next, are we saying that because he had a dark spirit inside of him, it was out of his hands? That it wasn't his fault? Yeah, I get it now. Between Shanann not being kind and appreciative, coupled with the dark spirit, yeah, I can see how some shit like this would just transpire and happen to him. Please allow me to read this again, as I think we're getting to the center of what happened, folks. Listen carefully. What had happened was, quote, He was in a state of extreme trauma from what had happened, and nothing still made sense to him. Because of that, and because he could still feel a dark spirit inside of him, he says he was not able to remember very much about what happened, end quote. Throughout this book, Scribble has not expanded on several topics that had the potential to be very interesting, such as, tell me more about these dark spirits and evil forces. I know she did talk about it in an earlier chapter, but it was not covered enough for my liking. All we get is a vague and mysterious tease. And all of these things, he will take them to his grave. But she will give us trivial info, like Shanann's bra was placed inside a different drying locker on a shelf. Inquiring minds want to know. Spill the tea, woman. Had we known she was going to actually go see him, we could have given her a list of questions to ask. I also want to know why he did not want the death penalty for himself. I mean, apparently he sees death as an option to a problem. Oh yeah, he was a chicken shit. I wonder if he was secretly abducted by non-human beings or something. Chris Watts seems to be very prone to suggestibility. There are people to call for that. They are called mental health professionals. And this one is gold too. Quote, Christopher prayed and asked God to please remove him from this prison so he didn't have to live in constant fear. Are Chris and Scribbles toying with my emotions, or are they both being totally serious right now? Because this segment of the book is obviously not copied from Discovery, so either she copied it from Chris's letters, or she had a burst of creativity and wrote it herself. But I hope he still lives in constant fear every moment of every day for the rest of his pathetic life. I feel like it is warranted and justified, as that is what he did to his victims. You caused them fear, Chris Watts. If what you say is true, you most certainly terrorized Bella. She knew that you had somehow become dangerous, and she was in a horrified state and alone. How could you, you monster? You're a dumbass, savage, weasel, bitch, dumbass, bastard, candy-ass, coward, good-for-nothing piece of chicken shit.
I've been told that name-calling and wishing ill will on this fucktard does not help the situation and that I'm being immature. Okay, I'll accept that. It may not help the situation. Nothing will help the situation. Nevertheless, a good old-fashioned and uncontrolled outburst of anger and frustration, otherwise known as a tantrum, always makes me feel better. So, Chris was being a wuss, I mean living in fear, and prayed to God to get him out of that particular slammer. And a couple of weeks later, God answered his prayer and sent him on a 15-hour van ride to Waupun, Wisconsin. My only hope was that they hogtied him and let him roll around the back of the van, hit every single pothole on the way. But then I read further, and much to my immature disappointment, they handcuffed him to a pole inside the van. He was scared that they were going to take him to a prison that was one of the most feared in Colorado. He nearly pissed himself when that was the one they pulled into. Why didn't Scribbles put in the book which prison this was? That would have been interesting to know. But anyway, dumb shit resolved with God that if this is where he wanted him to go, then so be it, as he knew there was a huge price to pay for what he had done. Well, I do hope he realizes this. But as fate would have it, they only stopped to use the facilities. After about 20 minutes, they were back on the road. So, I guess God was tinkering with his emotions. Proof that God does have a sense of humor. They drove all day and night and into the next evening. All the while, Dipshit had no idea where they were going. I hope some of his evil thoughts were intruding on that peanut mind of his. Shall we say, maybe an image that they were taking him to the ocean to drop him in, something like that. So they pulled into the small town of Wapan. Scribble says he didn't mind coming to Wisconsin, as he was far away from his family at either place. Well, I'm glad you didn't mind, Pea Brain. At least you still have a family. The Rusiks lost the majority of theirs at the hands of your wicked self. So it appears that Chris has settled in nicely. Good, because I was concerned about that. The guards seem better there, and he's not been treated badly by them. The food is tolerable, but he sometimes craves things like ice cream or pizza and Shanann spaghetti sauce. Do you now? Too bad she is not here to cook it for you. You know, if she wasn't being unkind or thoughtless, as you bogusly claimed last chapter. Scribble acknowledges Shanann was a very good cook. Chris thinks about how different life would be if he had made different choices. You mean like not having an affair, not shutting your wife out, not being cruel to her, not attempting to poison her with an overdose of narcotics? Had you not been snappy with the children? Had you not been ignoring the problems in your marriage and the relationship between your parents and wife? Had you not been ignoring your financial predicament if you had not buried your head in the sand and had not brutally murdered your pregnant wife and your delightful daughters? Had you not disposed of their bodies in a horrific manner? Had not lied to police, CBI, the FBI? Had not blamed your wife for murdering the beautiful daughters you shared together? I could go on and on and on, but yeah, if that stuff had not, quote, happened to you, as it keeps being reiterated in this book, Shanann would have been more than happy, I'm sure, to cook up a batch of spaghetti sauce. You also mentioned you liked the fried pizza dish when you had your Wisconsin interview. You'll be getting nothing of the sort for the rest of your days. But yeah, selfish asshole thinks about when he had it good. I certainly hope so. Scribble says, quote, he remembers sitting at home on a cold night with Shanann and the girls, enjoying a meal and playing with the girls. He can't help but to think, where did it all go wrong, or why did he think it was so wrong, end quote. Would have been nice to delve deeper into this statement, Scribble, now that he's had time to reflect. But we only get a few sentences in this book. Yes, why did he think things were so wrong and apparently unfixable? Even if Shanann was resistant at first, she did want to talk. She was starting to see from texts with her friends and talking with her friends the ways that she was being bossy, as has been said in this book like the not being able to hang a picture on the wall. She wanted to repair the relationship with your parents. 
She had already offered them an olive branch that they ignored when she sent the sonogram picture of Nico. She said to you, yes, let's list the house for sale. She had already started the process with the realtor, but what she was not okay with and would never have been okay with is you having an affair. But had you insisted on being in this doomed to fail relationship, you know, you were still in the honeymoon phase, but still, you could have gone on your merry way and pursued that, whether you chose to check out and leave your family, or whether you chose to stay and work on the marriage. Neither would have been easy, but things do get better in time, and it makes you really appreciate the good times. Damn, did I deviate from the topic again? Getting on with it. He was given a prison handbook that he is to keep always. He was forced to face reality when he read the part about family illness and funerals. It dawned on him he would never be able to attend a funeral or go to someone when they were sick, even if it's his parents. If a chaplain approves, videos may be sent for viewing a funeral. I don't think that should be allowed. He needs to sit with his own imagination. Scribble says he realizes he had everything and lost everything, or rather he threw it away in my eyes. Yeah, and he stomped and spit on it too. But could we know more, please? There are so many broad statements that could have been an entire chapter in itself. Asshole is housed in the pod with about 17 other men, most who are handicapped and in wheelchairs. Is this so they won't beat him up? Chris is handicapped too. His brain is mush. Some people get going pretty fast in their wheelchairs, and I'm not sure if Nimrod could outrun some of them. But she says Chris doesn't talk about his crime with anyone other than his sister, a friend, and with Scribble. So still not with his parents? Oh, that's right. He and his father only grunt to one another, and he told his mother to read this book if she wants to know what happened. I wonder if this friend is Anna, as seen on an HLN special. I found some clips from it. I'll play it at the end of this criticizing, I mean critiquing of this chapter. His next door neighbor in the pod was Jake Patterson, Jamie Kloss's kidnapper who also killed her parents. Scribble said he is, but now it was his neighbor. While she was scribing this book, he was moved for fighting. Patterson was transferred to a New Mexico prison in July because of security concerns at the Wisconsin prison where he began his sentence. This is where he got into a fight with another inmate this past June. Christopher had hoped he would cross his path because Jake Patterson is 21 years old. He said he was going to have a lot of time to think about and to deal with what he did. Book says, quote, Jake ended up in the cell right next to Christopher, so hopefully he says he will be able to reach him, end quote. So I don't know if Chris ever got the chance to preach God's word to him before he was moved. I wish it had been Chris Watts whose ass he had beat. And who is he to be talking to people about what they have done and all that? He's been in there a year. He's really not had that much time to reflect, in my opinion. Chris is in his cell for most of the day, but he is allowed recreational time. And when the weather is nice, he'll go outside and play basketball. Scribble writes that he says, quote, It's nice just to be in the sun and enjoy a breath of fresh air, end quote. Well, isn't that nice? You know, some of the things said by certain people are just in bad taste. For example, quote, it's nice just to be in the sun and enjoy a breath of fresh air, end quote. That's like when Cindy Watts said during her interview with a news station, quote, nobody dies in Colorado, end quote, talking about the death penalty for her beloved son. And now this, yeah, yes, Chris, it is nice to be in the sun and enjoy a breath of fresh air. Nice to know you have that opportunity. It gives me peace. So they have roll call every morning at 645, followed by breakfast, lunches at 1130, and dinner at 330 p.m. Well, I'm happy to hear he's getting three squares a day. I bet he does miss Shanann's cooking. There are no snacks, but he is allowed to go to the commissary every two weeks. One of the hardest things he's had to get used to is the lack of privacy. Aww. And of course, there is no freedom. Yep, you gave all of that up because of your harebrained idea. 
But what you do have is a lack of worries about having a roof over your head in a temperature controlled environment. All of your bills are gone. You don't have to worry about where your next meal is coming from or if you have clothes to wear. I wish we had gotten a description of his cell. It seems I remember hearing that he is able to buy a television from the commissary. Maybe it was from that Wisconsin interview he did with Tammy Coder and Baumhover. But I'm sure most of you listening would have appreciated knowing what it is really like for him. More detail. I'm tired of this vague shit. Also, his pod is right next to the infirmary. So if he ever has a medical issue, it's conveniently located to him. I'm glad to hear that everything has been working out so well for him. He can buy cards and things of that nature to send at holidays from the commissary. And he claims he's already forgotten what things cost outside of prison. You mean like house payments and secret dinners at Lazy Dog? The car museum in Boulder? The drag races at Bandemir Speedway? To camp at the Great Sand Dunes National Park? Awesome. Your freaking house was about to be foreclosed on. Yeah, shit's expensive, man. Scribble says he will never go to another birthday party, out to dinner, swimming, go to the beach, or a race with his dad, and that holidays are not recognized in prison. Quote, he misses such things as washing his car or mowing the lawn or feeling the rain or snow on his skin, end quote. Dumbass, did you really think you were going to get away with your horrible crime? I've not seen that mentioned in the book yet. I wonder if she asked him, did you think you were going to get away with this? I guess he did, or he wouldn't have done it, but what the hell's going on in that peanut brain? Is it one of those rotten, dried up peanuts that just rattles around? She says he will never have another love. I doubt that. He will succumb to one of those love letters he gets eventually. Mark my word. There's a rumor on another YouTube channel that he and this Anna chick want to have a baby together. I wonder how that would work. Not really, because it causes me to have ugly visions in my head that I can't shake. I just threw up in my mouth a little. Christmas of 2018, only four months after the murders, was an extremely lonely time for CW. Well, good. He did not have a Christmas tree, he didn't get to take the girl sledding, didn't play Santa Claus, and it made him sad that Bella would have turned five years old then. Yet, yeah, all that shit made us really sad too. He spends his day reading and writing letters. He gets a ton of mail. Most of it is said that he throws it away, and supposedly he has no desire to pursue a relationship stemming from his fan mail. He does answer some letters. Scribble claims he hopes to not receive any mail from Nikki, as he wants her to have peace and to move on with her life. Yet, in an interview, she said that he thinks Nikki writes to him in cryptic messages, and that he is still in love with her. Not the first contradiction I've heard from this author. I scribe, I mean. Daily Mail said after the murders, Watts told Cato, quote, all I could feel was now I was free to be with Nikki. Feelings of my love for her was overcoming me. I felt no remorse. End quote. Okay, so this was right after the murders, and one could argue, I reckon, that he no longer feels that way. Yet, according to Daily Mail on October 3rd, 2019, when talking about the letters from Christopher book, quote, he told Cato he has received some letters and postcards signed with different names and wonders if they might be from the woman he calls his soulmate, end quote. Also, Chris Watts still loves his mistress and wanted to be with her so much he slaughtered his family, end quote. Anyway, Chris says he is sorry Nikki lost her job and had to move. Wasn't that special? I don't recall him ever saying he's sorry for the murders, but he did say he has no remorse. I do remember that. I will, of course, link in the description the Daily Mail article that I referenced earlier. He spends a lot of time looking out the window. At least he has a window in which to look out. I personally think that is spoiling him. But supposedly, he can't believe what he had wasn't good enough for him. Yeah, a lot of us have thought that very same thing, Chris. But supposedly, Nimrod would give anything to have it all back. 
On June 22, 2019, Ronnie visited Chris for the first time since the night he confessed. He had business in Chicago, and his boss graciously told him to use the opportunity to go and see his son. They were able to spend three hours together. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall for that meeting. Visitors can bring up to $20 of change to use in the vending machine in the visitation room. Ronnie bought him a burger and heated it in the microwave. Also a bag of Doritos, Red Mountain Dew, his favorite, and a Kit Kat, Milky Way, and Nestle's Crunch Bar. Chris scarfed it all down. When the visit was over, it was difficult for them both, but of course, they held in their emotions as always. No wonder Chris became unhinged and flipped his damn lid. You can't bottle all of that shit up, otherwise it'll come all pouring out at once like a damn volcano. On June 25, 2019, Frank and Sandy Rusick's lawyer, and of course Rusick is spelled wrong throughout the book, but, but their lawyer called Chris to discuss probate, and Chris signed everything over to Shanann's parents. Mr. Rusick came to the phone and thanked him. Chris told Frank Sr. that he loved him, and Frank responded back, Love you. They are such good, honest, moral, and loving people. I don't know that I would have held it together and not badmouth this criminal the way they have done. They really do set a shining example. They never asked to be thrust into the spotlight because of these horrifying crimes, but somehow they knew what to do and how to act and do it all with grace. After the phone call with the lawyer and briefly speaking with his former father-in-law, Chris went back to his cell and cried and cried because he thought he would never hear those words again. First of all, he cried. Where was this emotion before? Remember when he said he felt nothing and no remorse after the murders? And thinking he would never hear those words again. Scribble, do you mean from Frank or from anyone? Another indeterminate statement. Do his parents ever tell him they love him? If not, well, there is at least a small part of the problem. I make sure and tell my family members I love them every time I talk to them. It's not just words. I mean it and they know it. But we aren't talking about me, I know. I just don't get it when people find it hard to say those words. That was very gracious and kind of Mr. Rusick. A fine man he is. Scribble ends the chapter with another one of her noncommittal set of questions. Quote, Many would say he deserved less than he gets. However, if he was oppressed by a dark spirit, does he deserve another chance? He is not seeking an appeal right now, but should he? I will leave that answer up to you as the reader. End quote. Well, I would say no, no, and no. Please. Okay, let me entertain this for a moment. Say he was oppressed by a dark spirit. How would you prove this? And if you were able to prove it, in what way would that make him not responsible for what he did? Perhaps he shouldn't have been playing hocus pocus with Nikki and her friends, and he has said he will keep the dark shit that went on in her apartment to his grave, so this notion is ridiculous. And what would be the reason for an appeal? He was given ample opportunity to change his mind about the guilty plea. The judge asked him if he understood everything. He said yes, and he didn't change his mind about the plea because he is guilty. Judge Kopkow accepted his guilty plea, and still, he had a chance to withdraw the plea before sentencing, or to say that he didn't understand what he had agreed to. I would be very shocked if he tried and succeeded with an appeal although a trial would be glorious to watch. The last thing she says is that his parents recently received the wallet Chris had on him when he was arrested, and that it had $13 in it. And she asks, quote, is this a coincidence, end quote. Come on, give me a break. Like Forrest Gump said, that's all I have to say about that. And that will be the end of this video. I will pick up with chapter 27 in the next one. Thank you for listening. He is in a, a pod, they call it, with handicapped men. Um, they're close to the infirmary. It's a small area, I think of about 17 people. 
Christopher believes that if he's ever in general population that he will have a very difficult time. Cheryl Lynn Cadle spent 15 hours with Chris Watts at the Dodge Correctional Institute in Wisconsin. Christopher reads a lot. What does he read? Mainly he reads uh, Christian books. Before the face-to-face -face meetings, the 65-year-old grandmother exchanged handwritten letters with Watts. The 34-year-old opened up about everything, including his emotional sentencing. He says that there's times that during the sentencing that he just wanted to run and bash his head against the wall. Her new book, Letters from Christopher, also contains notes Watts wrote to his dead wife and daughters. She says he seems detached from his crimes. He doesn't talk a lot about the girls. He talks more about Shanann. Cheryl Lynn also spoke with Watts' parents. Apparently, his mom believes Shanann killed the children. I believe that Cindy Watts hated Shanann so much that she can't get past the fact that thinking that Shanann killed her own daughters. The book is clearing up claims that Watts had affairs with a man and a woman he met on Tinder. Christopher said he had never cheated on Shanann until Nikki. Watts met Nicole Kessinger at work. The pair had been seeing each other for two months when he decided to annihilate his family so he could be with her. What has he told you about his feelings towards Nikki now? He says he still loves her, that he loved her like he had never loved anyone else before. And at the same time, he'll tell you he loves Shanann. He did feel that had he never met Nikki, this would never have happened. Sherilyn says Chris Watts plotted the murder of his wife and two daughters so he could be with his mistress, Nicole Kessinger. She had almost a spell. He was so attracted to her that he was mesmerized by her. And she showed him respect, and he didn't feel like he had ever been shown that before. It's just one of the shocking revelations made in Sherilyn's new book, Letters from Christopher. The grandmother of 11 says she was compelled to meet with Watts after first seeing him on the news. The very first morning that I saw Christopher, it just struck me. He, there was such a lost look at, uh, when watching him on television that day. There was never any doubt in your mind that he was guilty never, of these crimes? Never. Any doubt at all. Cheryl Lynn and Watts exchanged multiple letters. She showed the correspondence to DailyMail.com senior reporter Louise Boyle. You can see here his... His writing is small. This is like a 10, 12 page letter here that, he, mm -hmm. that he's written. You'll recall Watts first told investigators he killed Shanann in a fit of rage. He told me that he was not angry. It did not happen in a fit of rage like he had told the FBI. That it happened very calmly as she was drifting off to sleep. That he knew how to squeeze the jugular veins in her neck to cut off the oxygen supply. One thing that bothered me is he wouldn't look at me in the eye. He wants people to think good of him. It's very hard for him to be called a monster um, or to be called a murderer. I am super, super, super pumped about 2018. I'm calling because I'm concerned about a friend of mine. What's her name? Shanann Watt. I just want them back. <laughs> I, just, I just want them to come back and if if they're not safe right now, that's what's that's what's tearing me apart. Do you guys have any kind of issues, marital issues? Sure. Oh, you sure. I don't even want to say it, but like I had to. I just felt like there was already something in my mind that was implanted that I was going to do it, and I woke up that morning that it was going to happen. It's been nearly a year since Chris Watts brutally murdered his pregnant wife and two young daughters. This weekend, HLN has never before seen evidence, exclusive photos and interviews with those close to the family man turned murderer. Here's a look at the all new cri lies, crimes and video. Killer dad, Chris Watts speaks. Bella, Celeste, if you're out there, just, just, just come back. What's your name? I don't have another one. I think I met him sometime in June, probably early June. It might have been May. Like every time I close my eyes, I start to see her saying, Daddy, no. So, so heartbreaking, especially uh, that last line there. Let's bring in crime journalist Pat LaLama. She was front and center in our coverage as we watch this play out. Pat, good to see you again. Well, now we're finding out some new stunning information about those visiting uh, Chris Watts. The visitation list is out. Who's seeing this guy?
Well, you know, first of all, let me just say uh, this. It's important to watch this special, Mike, because of all the cases I've covered in the last few years, this is the one most viewers have written me about, friends ask about at cocktail parties and dinners, because it's so horrific to think of a father dumping his two children down oil vats. There's so many unanswered questions. Now, back to your question. Yes, he has uh, a few visitors. But one in particular is quite interesting. It's a woman named Anna, and she has met Chris after the fact, since he has been in prison. And he's opened up to her a lot. Now, take what you will about what he says about what drove him to his crimes. And a lot of them have to, a lot of those reasonings are behind his affair or involved in his affair with that Nicole Kessinger. Check it out. Chris feels that if the affair would have never happened and she would have never came into his life, that the murders would never have happened. Um, he, he thinks that she had this strong control over him um, that he describes like a leash that he wasn't able to get off of or get away from. And he thinks that that has played a role in what happened. <laughs> so he's claiming it's the hold on him by the mistress. Mike, That's what was the key. Mike, wow. Li listen to this. Does it, st I mean, this shouldn't shock you because all along it's somebody else's problem. It's never that he takes responsibility. Right. You're right. And, and you know, they had, you remember all the sordid details about even Nicole admitting that they had sex four times a day. So yeah, maybe there was this sexual, you know, uh, hold that she had on him, but let's just make it clear. She had nothing to do with murder. She had nothing to do with driving right. him to murder and she is not responsible in any way legally for these and it's just a he's still appalling after all this time i mean it's hard to i'm you know we're supposed to remain objective as journalists but it's just so hard to in this case absolutely i mean and more de stunning details like that coming up th yeah. this, this saturday anybody else visiting and you got family members coming his way as well well you know what he did have an actual physical contact meeting with his father the first as far as we understand, the first person he actually got to, there was no partition between he and the visitor like, it, it, like he has with the new friend Anna. With his dad, he actually had um, a sit-down face-to-face with his father. And it'd be really interesting to find out, you know, what those two talked about. You know, it's a father loves his child no matter what. And uh, I'd love to know, you know, I'd love to be a fly on the wall during those meetings. One other person from what we gather, and correct me if I'm wrong, it, do we have an author in our midst who wants to hear his story? Are we uh, gathering that? I, I, I think there probably most definitely will be an author in the future. Hopefully he won't be able to capitalize financially on any of that. Mm. But yeah, I suspect you can find something like wow. that down the road. Okay, there you go. Well, Pat, thanks again so much. Pat sure. Lama, crime journalist, again, front center on our coverage and continues to be. When his wife and two daughters mysteriously disappeared, Chris talked. Shannon, Bella, Celeste, if you're out there, just, just just come back. And talked. I did not cheat on my wife. And talked. It's like I respect my wife and she respects me. He may be behind bars now, but he's not done talking. I have spoke to Chris while he's in prison about once a week. I visit him about every two to three weeks. When Chris talks to me about Shanann, he talks to me about how great she was and how much he loved her. Chris feels like he had a break in reality, like, like he snapped, like he was demon-possessed. Chris's mom fills us in on what the murderous man is now saying to his parents. Happy birthday, Mom, 64. I wish I could be there with everyone. He strangled his pregnant wife. Why can't I just let go? And murdered his two daughters. It's gone. There's no bringing them back. Every moment of the investigation was caught on camera. Hey, Chris, I'm Sir Coonrod for the police department. So, do you have any idea where your wife is? You thought the story was bad. 
gets worse. Every time I closed my eyes, I started to fear her saying, Daddy, no, and that was it. Lies, Crimes, and Video, Saturday at 8 on HLN. Hey, everybody. So I wanted to show you guys our room. We have a really pretty room. Um, San Diego is gorgeous so far. Really, really pretty. They say it's called um, the June Gloom. So I'll show you guys the room and everything. So we're going to check in early. So here's the room. My favorite part, though, is outside. Like, take my shoes off. Look outside. Even though you see the June gloom in, in uh, San Diego, this is our view from our room. Isn't that beautiful? It's going to be really pretty seeing the sunset and the sunrises here. And that looks like at a restaurant that I want to go eat at because I'm starving. Hey, Steve. Or should I say the baby's starving? Because I don't eat this early and this much. There's Cheesecake Factory, season uh, 62, I think, or something. Um, there's a lot of restaurants right there. I'm so hungry now. Um, I was going to freshen up. Food is more important. So, we're here in San Diego. Um, I have no idea what we're going to do today. We might hit the pool up when it gets warmer. Hey, Dana. I'm so excited to meet you. Um, so, oh my gosh, palm trees. I haven't seen palm trees. Take that back. We haven't seen them since we were in Mexico in October. I feel like we don't see things anymore, but we do all the time. So, hopefully it clears up today like everyone says it does. And we can go. He's helping me um, get the bag situated real quick. What up? going on so all right guys i am going to finish unpacking real quickly so i can go down and eat some food because i'm hungry um and we'll see everybody here shortly because everyone's kind of arriving so i'm excited bye guys Hey everybody! Oh, hey. <laughs> we're live. Um, so we're on a two-hour cruise here in San Diego. It's absolutely gorgeous here. <laughs> so here's the crew. There's Scott. We're live. Chris, somewhere. <laughs> So, um, we're sitting out here enjoying uh, the amazing weather. Um, it's absolutely beautiful, like, so beautiful here. Um, really excited and <laughs> having so much fun. Who do we have? So, if you're on here, um, definitely share this, but also hashtag live or hashtag replay. Hey, Matt. Can't see. How's Brittany doing? So Brittany is um, a new promoter and Matt is her husband. Awesome. She's due any day. Um, <laughs> congratulations. So we're here. Say hi. Hi guys. I love you. I'm sorry I missed your baby shower. <laughs> she, she missed her baby shower so we're having fun. So um, we're just enjoying San Diego. It's absolutely gorgeous here. Um, it's been pretty nice. These lifestyle getaways are so much fun to be able to be here with everybody and enjoy yourself. It's not work. It's like 90% play. <laughs> yes, having a lot of fun. But we're and still eating working. a lot of food. <laughs> yes. Eating a lot of food. Thank God for burn. Sightseeing. It's a good thing we're all on burn. Except yeah. for me. Oh. <laughs> Shanann can't be on burn. <laughs> I feel for soon, you. Soon. Soon. Hey, everybody. Who else? Well, so, this is Teresa. We have Carmen. Okay. So, oh, all right, awesome. everybody. Oh, hold on. Oh, go ahead. You're good. We're just waving. Everybody. Oh, I got you. You're waving. Ahead of us San Diego You're waving. Show them the views. The views. Are you guys ready? Hold on. Property seven million dollars in 1960, honey. Thirty-seven million dollars to build and buy an off ramp for this bridge. The bridge has five lanes of traffic overhead. Three in the heavy direction. Two in the lighter direction. Set up to go toward Coronado. About midday, they moved the median over. That planes are coming back toward San Diego in the afternoon. 
the prison that's over it for about 30 years and has been paid off per spring. This is this that they hit you the top of all my no bicycles, no pedestrians. So we're having fun. We'll come back live again later. We still have another almost 48 hours here. I'm excited. <laughs> so we'll be back later and share a little bit more San Diego. It's absolutely beautiful though. I'm glad they chose this one because it's one of our bucket lists for sure. I had never so, been here before. Uh, other than as a little kid and yeah, the vibe here, the people are really laid back. Everybody is just on a positive vibe frame. Do you feel that way? Yeah, like everybody's just happy. Happy. Having a good time. <laughs> And we fit in well because we're always yes, happy. We so, so I wonder how many thrivers we can get while we're down here. So the ships can move under here 24 hours. <laughs> Everyone's been asking, what is those stickers? I know. So, all right, everybody, we're going to come back later. We have better signal. You guys have a great day. We're going to enjoy the beautiful weather. The sea and the sky. And if it looks freshly painted, they just put a new